you know, when, oh, never mind. I digress. It's like watching the worst TV show you've ever seen in your life, but being forced to watch it. We, we joked about having cardboard cutouts of ourselves and just putting them in our desk and see if you would notice that. And I'm hoping the mic wasn't on to pick up our commentary and that he couldn't lip read, you know. At any rate, it has been so long, I have no idea what this class is about. Can someone <laughs> Just kidding. The, yeah. <laughs> hey, whatever works. Uh, there's a couple things I want to review with you um, before we get into um, a set of tags that are called sort of like the structural tags. Um, and first thing I want to review to you with you is showing file extensions because that's that's something that's important. All right. Um, are, are we all aware of what a file extension is? All right. A name of a file actually has two parts. So like if I go into Word and I, I create a, a document called Resume and save it, it will actually get saved at, on the disk as resume.docx. And the docx part of it is what's called the file extension. And the file extension is usually three or four characters and it defines like what kind of file it is. All right. And so then Windows or whatever operating system you're using knows how to open that file. All right. So for example, if you try to open a DOCX file and knows it's Word and it opens it up. Now, one second. Uh, 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 now, uh, for most, most people don't really need to worry about that. The stuff does its job, it opens up correctly, and we don't need to worry about that. So on many machines, file extensions are turned off. So you don't see those extensions. Yes? When did DOC become DOCX? Um, within the last two or three versions of, of, of Office. So Office 2007 would be my guess. Because it's, it's like a wildly different format that they're storing stuff under now. All right, but as developers, as web developers, we sometimes need to know the exact file name. So we need to make sure, for example, that we named our files .html. Because if you don't name .html, it's not going to work right. Um, it's possible it might not work right. Um, in addition, when we get into images and other things, we need to know the exact name. And that includes the file name and the extension. So we want to turn file extensions on. Now, it's different depending on the version of Windows or other operating systems that you're working on. Let me show you. This is Windows 7. Let me show you how to do it in Windows 7. And um, I can give you a hand in lab that has Windows 8 if you're, if you're having trouble. Uh, in addition, uh, if you have something different at home, um, you know, a quick Google should show you that, uh, uh, what to do. But to turn file extensions on, you go in and you open a folder. So the desktop is actually just sort of a folder. And I go up under Organize. And I pick Folder and Search Options. And I go under View. Then there's an option that says Hide Extension for Known File Types. And right now it's checked. I'm going to uncheck it. But first, I'm going to go to show you. I'm going to go to a specific folder and do it. I'll go to the Sample Pictures folder. Notice there it lists there's chrysanthemum, desert, hydrangeas, jellyfish, and so on. But you don't see the file extension. If I go up here under Organize, Folder and Search Options, View, and I click that off that says Hide Extensions from Known Files, now it will show me the full name. So now it says chrysanthemum.jpg and desert.jpg and so on down the line. And that's important because if I was going to build a web page that had these images on it, I would need to know the, the complete precise name. All right. So a lot of times as we get into linking pages together, 
um, or including images on our page or including CSS files on our page, um, we need to know the exact file name. And, and if you don't know the extension, you really don't know the exact file name. A JPEG, for example, can end in .jpg or .jpeg. An HTML file can actually end in HTML or HTM. So just because you know the type of file it is doesn't mean you know the exact file name. So turning on file extensions gives you the definitive answer. Second thing I want to talk about is the best way to turn in your work. Because the first assignment was just like one file, right? So it was pretty easy to, 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 to upload it to Angel. A lot of our subsequent assignments are going to be more than one file, all right? So for example, you might have two pages that are linked together. You might have a page with an image on it and a CSS file or something like that. You may have a set of pages. My suggestion is to do this. Put everything into a folder. So let me go and download. Let me download the example that we were looking at last time. Here's a good example. It includes two pages. All right. The best thing to do is if you have multiple files, is to go in and create a folder. So I'm going to go and create a new folder, and I'll call it, you know, lab two, let's say. Make sure all your files are in that folder. So for example, in this case, I have the two HTML pages, first and second. If you have images, if you have CSS files, if you have anything else, put them all in this folder. All right, put everything in this folder. And then go in, right mouse on it if you're using Windows. There should be an option that says send to and it will say compressed folder. And that'll create what's called a zip file. Um, it actually, Windows makes it act like a folder, but actually it's, it's a single file. And then you can upload that one file and I'll get all of your stuff. I'll get all the files that, that you uh, are sending me. So it's good to do that as well. Now, one thing that students have noticed is when you download a zip file, for example, if you were to download the example that I did last week, or if you upload your assignment and then download it, a lot of students will do this. They'll go into the zip file, into the folder, and say, hey, the links don't work. Well, the reason is, is because you can't view files very well inside a zip file. You can sort of view them, but because everything's sort of smashed together into one file, there aren't really the separate files that you might think there are. All right? So therefore, you need to extract the zip file before you can view the contents of it. And the way you do that is, you can right mouse on it, extract all, It'll give you the name of a folder that you can extract it to. I'll just call it new. And now notice that the link works. All right, because now I truly do have those two files sitting out on disk. When they're in the zip folder, I really don't have the two files there. It sort of looks like it does, but they're really not there. So zipping is good for number one, it compresses files. So um, it can save space, it'll make the uploads and downloads a little quicker. 
But they're also very valuable for convenience purposes. So like you don't have to sit there and upload a bunch of files manually. So be sure everything that you have for an assignment is in a folder and zip up that folder and upload it. And I can give uh, a hand to anyone in lab that um, is unsure about this. All right, on to structural tags. If we go to most every website that's out there, oh, let's pick a website. I always like the Olympics. Let's go to the Olympics website. All right. If we look at this website, we'll notice there are some sections here. There is what you call a navigation up here a set of links to take you to different places. So you can watch videos, see the TV listing, see about figure skating, skiing, snowboarding. As we scroll down, there's little news articles. All right, little articles here. There's an article there. You could call this an article. call that an article, and so on down the line. Let's pick another site. Wall Street Journal. We have sort of a banner on the top that tells us where we are. We have, again, a navigation. Then we have a series of articles here. Many pages, I forgot to look on the Olympic page, but many pages also have, or many sites also have something at the bottom that's kind of like a footer. All right? If you went around and you looked at, you know, 10 different sites, my guess is most of them, a clear majority, would have some, all of them would probably have a certain set of defined sections. A header on the top that tells you what the site is. All right, it's good to know. You should let the person know as soon as they hit that site what the site is about so they don't have to guess. All right, there'll be a navigation that will be clearly defined, a set of links that allows you to move around between the different pages of the site. There'll be the actual content, and there might be articles, all right, uh, there might be sections of articles. You know, a, a news page may have a news section and a sports section on the same page. Or might have a national news and local news section, and there's articles in each of them. And then finally at the bottom, there's a footer that has stuff that's important, but maybe uh, not directly as important. Just other stuff that you want to make sure is on the page, but doesn't really deserve prominence. All right? Now, remember our job in HTML is to tag our page. In other words, describe the content on the page. So there's a set of tags that are used to, to break down our page into sections and to define those sections. And these tags are valuable. They help the browser display the page correctly. And they're going to be valuable when we get into styling the page, all right, which we might get into. All right. Let me go in. Let me describe. Um, uh, um, there's five or six of these. I hope I remember them all. If not, we'll come back to them. Let me describe what those sections are, what those section tags are. There is the header section of the page. I sometimes call this like the banner of the page. Typically, it answers the question, what is this site? And it answers it with a combination of text and uh, maybe, in some cases, images. You know, there might be uh, a company logo. Going back to the Wall Street Journal page, um, actually, there is no logo on this one. 
But if we were to go to Invacare, thank you. Yeah, there we go. We'll see that in addition to text, there's actually a logo up here. All right. So these things are important. You shouldn't assume that someone knows what your website is when they get to it. Even if it's obvious, I don't care if you're the Ford Motor Company, put up there, this is the website of the Ford Motor Company, right? And the purpose of it and what it's for. And that's sort of what the header is for. The navigation section of the site allows you to navigate to different pages. Usually your own pages, but sometimes it could be other pages that are out on the web. And that's the nav section, all right, or the nav. I'm actually putting the tag names up here, by the way. So the tag for the header section is header, the tag for the nav is nav, and so on down the line. The next one is article. And that is something that, you know, is like a news article. It doesn't have to be a news article, right? It could be, um, a, you know, an article on Wikipedia. That's an article, right? A page, you know, each, each Wikipedia page typically contains one article, something about a topic, all right? A set of paragraphs all related to one topic. All right, so news article is a good example of it, but by no means is it the only only uh, example that you can think of. It could have multiple articles on a page, right? For example, if I was talking about um, CISS courses, um, I could have an article about CISS 216, an article about CISS 121, an article about that, all on the same page. So yes, you could have. Um, more than one article on a page. There is an aside tag. And what that relates to is where there is like some additional information that may not be as important, but it might like go off on a tangent or something along those lines. Let me look to see. A lot of times you'll see this in newspapers. Um, I don't see a real good example here. Yeah, it's like a sub-article. Like, for example, let's say there was an article about the Super Bowl. All right. The main article might be about the Super Bowl and might have in, in a predictions and what each team is going to try to do and so on and so forth. There might be an aside that talks about what the weather is expected to be. Right? You know, that's related, but it's not sort of the main topic of it. It's, it's an aside. It's like, it's like a diversion. Um, the idea is, is you can break it up that way. And if someone's interested, they can go and read the aside. If not, they can skip it. So it would be like, if, like, last night I went to National Geographic to look at the owls. Right. The, the snow. Mm -hmm. And they had an article about the owls, and then they had, like, an aside which said, you know, what their longevity is. Right. That, that, that's a great example. A uh, person said on National Geographic site they were on a page about snow owl, owls. There was an article about the snow owls, and there was an aside that said like how long they live, what they eat, where they're found, and, and so on. So yeah, that's another good example. It's where it's related to the article, but like sort of uh, a little bit of a tangent, or it's something that you're setting apart from the main article for whatever reason. Yes. So Not really, 
the, that's why it's not really important to split hairs. Like we'll talk about a couple of these in a second here. Um, like an aside versus an article, you know. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but like, for example, is the, is, the, is the article about the weather of the Super Bowl, is that a different second article, or is it an aside to the first article? Well, I don't know. Pick one. All right? There's no reason to sit there and agonize about it. You're describing the structure of the page, and the more accurately you do it, the better off it will be now and with any other future enhancements that happen on the web. But there's no really need to sort of agonize uh, about that. The next one is oops, a section. And a section is where you have a, a page or, or a, a portion of a page that doesn't really fit any of these other categories. All right. Let's say, for example, you had, again, getting back to the Olympics, let's say you had a section of the page that showed a, an athlete sponsor. Right? Athletes get sponsored by everyone under the sun. So a particular athlete might be um, sponsored by Subway and L.L. Bean and whatever. It's not really an article. It's not really navigation. It's not telling you how to get to that. It's not really the banner. It's not really an aside. But it's definitely a distinct section. So the section tag is available for that. All right. For content that is a, a unit of itself, but doesn't really fit in these other categories. All right. Again, it's not essential. Or, or it's not important to agonize about this. If you look at something and say, I think it's an article, and if I looked at it and says, well, I'd probably put that more as a section, it's not like I'm going to take points off for it. All right? It's like there, you know, there's, there's no one absolute right way to do it. But do take a minute to think about it. So would an aside and a section kind of be Aside and a section, yeah. Related? Yeah, in a way, they could be related. In other words, you could make it a section or... Uh, Well, any of these things you, you want to. Uh, as, as a designer, your job is going to be to try to direct people to uh, the, the things that you want them to see. All right? And you'll apply a lot of techniques for that. An example of how you might use a section might be that you might put a section around a article and an aside about the Super Bowl. Right? This is the Super Bowl section of my sports page. Here's the main article about it. Maybe here's two or three articles about it. One about each of the starting quarterbacks and one about the defenses. And then there's an aside to talk about the weather. And all of those will be in the Super Bowl section. All right. The last thing is a footer. And a footer is, again, information that you put at the bottom. A lot of times they'll be sort of the less important links, like maybe the, the, the contact us links or the terms of service or privacy notice or something like that. Um, a lot of times there's copyright information uh, at the bottom of the page and so on. Yeah, the, the kind of things that people don't, wouldn't necessarily go there for, but is important. Like you mentioned like careers. You know, most people that come to L, uh, you know, to Lorraine Community's website probably aren't people looking for jobs here. But there are some people that do come to uh, our, our site to see, well, I wonder if there's any jobs available at the college. Well, that's an important link, but it's maybe not one of the most critical ones. Well, you don't want to include all the possible links on the main navigation, so you might put that in the footer then. All right. All of these are HTML5. tags. These came about in HTML5. And depending on what browser you're using, they could cause you some trouble. I'm going to use the Chrome browser because I know Chrome does a good job of implementing HTML5. We'll talk about 
uh, workarounds for older browsers uh, in a subsequent class. I don't think we're quite ready for that today. But do know that if you try this on a browser and it doesn't work right, try downloading Google Chrome and, and testing on that. All right. Later on, we'll talk about workarounds for other browsers. But we want to keep it simple initially. Now, all of these tags in HTML5 replaced one tag in previous versions of HTML, and that was the div tag. And div simply means a division of the page. It means the same thing as like a section, roughly, a section of the page. But because way back when there was HTML4, there wasn't a special tag for the header and a special tag for the footer and a special tag for the navigation, web developers put everything in div tags and had a div tag for the header, a div tag for the footer, a div tag for the navigation. I mention this for a couple reasons. You can still use div to describe a section of the page or to group things together into a unit. But you're probably going to be better off going forward using the HTML5 tags. All right, because these are more precise in describing the content of your page. I mention this because on occasion, if you work in web development, you may see examples out there, and I would want you to recognize what a div tag is. All right? Or you might have a job where your job is to change uh, someone else's web page, in which case it's good to know what a div tag is. All right? The one thing all these tags have in common, the question was, is functionally what these do. These tags are all block tags. Let me describe what a block tag is. Most of the tags that we've seen in this class so far have been block tags. What that means is that if I have a header tag and a nav tag underneath it, the header will be up here and the nav will be underneath it. It'll start on a new line. It won't be next to it horizontally. We've seen link tags, which are the opposite of block tags. They're inline tags. So if you have some text and then you have a link, the link, which is an A tag, appears in the middle of the text. It doesn't appear on a line by itself. So we have inline tags and we have block tags. Now remember, when we get to CSS, we'll be able to control that with more uh, fine degree of uh, control. We'll be able to, to position things exactly where we want them to be. All right. So let's go back and let's alter the example we had last time and let's add some of these new structural tags in here. All right, notice it's not giving me the opportunity to open a notepad. What I can do instead is bring up notepad. And I can file open, desktop, lab 2. Doesn't show it. Oh, it's looking for text files. Let me go and change that to all files. Now I can open that up. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to make some changes to this page to incorporate in um, the, uh, the additional tags uh, that we had. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a header tag. And 
And in this, I'm going to say Put a header so that anyone landing on this page knows exactly what they're seeing. Lorraine Country Community College. I'll walk around in cowboy hats and spurs. All right. I'll save this and we'll view it. I'm going to do a bit of this at a time. You'll notice there it is. The top is a block tag, so everything starts underneath it. And other than that, we don't really see a difference. Now, I recognize that this is a little confusing because we have a head tag and we have a header tag, plus we have the H1s through H6s. All right? That's just something you have to remember. Don't blame me. I didn't make this up. All right? The head tag, again, the head tag is along with the body tag, where the head tag has information about the page, such as a title and our CSS code will go there and other things will go there. So every page is going to have a head, it's going to have a body. Inside the body, there's the header, which is the page's header, which is information describing what the page or site is about. And then the H1s and H2s are individual headlines. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have, I'm going to create a navigation. And oftentimes, Navigations, navigation is really just a list of links, right? That's what pretty much we define a navigation as. And as such, I'm going to make an unordered list and I'm going to put all my links inside of this. Now I don't, I only have the two pages, so I'm going to just copy this one link a couple of times. And I'm going to put a link from this page back to itself. Now you might think that that is odd. Why would I put a link to a page back to itself on the navigation? Yeah, and just for consistency. All right. In other words, I'm going to want my navigation to look pretty much the same on every page. So if my navigation says page 1, page 2, page 3, page 4, then it can look like that on every single page. If instead I have on one page it's page 2, page 3, page 4, and then if I go to page 2 it says page 1, page 3, page 4, that will get to be confusing. So even though in a way it's sort of redundant to put a link back to itself, I'm going to do that so I can maintain a consistent navigation on every page. All right? Because that's a good thing. All right? And I'll make these links even though I don't have a page out there. All right. Now, this is an article about my spring classes. All right. So I'm going to put all this in an article tag.
Now, you might say, could I make this a section and have web development as an article and have other classes as an article? Yes, you could. I chose to consider this just one article, all right, that has a couple of parts in it, but you could have made that a section and then have the web development as an article, the iPhone development as an article. Again, it's not worth agonizing for, as long as you do what makes sense to you. All right. Finally, I'm going to put a footer on the bottom of the page. And when you look at it, you're not going to be too impressed, I don't think. Because <laughs> it really doesn't look that much different than what we had before. All right? Except we now have the ability, we now have the hooks in place to style this, to make the things pop that we want to pop make the things stand out that we want to stand out so we don't lose track of things and things don't get lost in the shuffle. All right? If you were to look at this, this really just looks like just a blob of information. Nothing really stands out. And it's not apparent where the navigation is and what an article is and what a footer is and all that. But we now have it position where we can go in and we can style these things and we can allow the user to see and to visually organize the stuff on the page all right based on our style rules right now it's just a string of data but we're going to try to do better than that and we can style it in addition we've described how this document is structured so any software now or later on that is going to be looking at this has a good description of what that is. It knows what the navigation is. So therefore, assistive technology, which is things such as screen readers, all right, that use, uh, are used by blind people, um, could be developed to, to jump right to the nav section of a page so that the, the person can navigate to the page. All right? Search engines can maybe browse articles. All right? All these things, when you describe the content of the page, you make all these things possible. And the web might not even have that level of sophistication yet, but you've put the code in place so if it does evolve that way, your page, and inevitably it will, your pages uh, uh, can be dealt with in an effective manner. Questions? What I want to do now is I want to, I, I've said all these things, I made all these promises about like you'll be able to style it, you'll be able to style it. I think I owe it to you to do a little bit of styling on this just to show so you can see the benefit of this. All right. So what I'm going to do, if you look at any of this and say I don't like the way that looks, everything is just black font on a white background. Nothing really stands out. How do I know that that's the navigation? How do I know that this is the banner and this is... You don't, all right? But by us formatting things a certain way, you'll be able to tell that with a lot better. And the more styling that we put on the page and the more styling that you learn, the better job that you can get in focusing your user's attention to the stuff that's important. So I'm going to go in on this page and I'm going to create some CSS code. Now, I'm going to keep it simple at first, and I'm going to put my CSS code in the HTML page itself. All right? Later on, we'll be able to put the CSS code in a separate file and simply point to that file so that we can change one CSS file and change the appearance of all our web pages. 
But right, right now, we'll, we're keeping it simple. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a style tag. Start and end, just like every other tag. The style tag tells the browser, hey, you're not in HTML land anymore. You're in CSS land. So everything between the start and end style is not HTML code, but is CSS code. All right? We're going to keep things simple, and we're going to play around with the color of the page. All right? The color of the page and the color of the, the fonts. All right? So, here's how CSS works. CSS is a set of rules that have two parts. The first part is called the selector. The selector says what on the page gets this style. Then, you have a set of attributes that describe what that section of the page is going to look like. So, for example, if I say body and I say background yellow, let's just do that to start. All right. Body is a selector. So everything inside that body tag is going to get this style. What's inside the body tag? Well, the whole page is inside the body tag. So in other words, the whole page is going to get this style. That's the selector. Enclosed in these curly brackets or braces, you'll see there's the name of an attribute, a colon, and then the value for the attribute. Now these aren't things that I just made up, right? These are standardized things, and we'll learn these throughout the semester. But background is aspects of the background, and we can, we can set the background as a color. So I say background colon yellow means it's going to make a background color for the whole page yellow. So if I go and save this, and view it. There we go. The whole page is yellow. Now, we really didn't do anything to make this stand out, all right, make the different sections stand out, but we did make the web page yellow, so well, that might make it a little less boring. That might you know, go with the theme of our website. If our website is about the Tour de France, for example, where the yellow jersey means you're the winner, that would help set the mood for the site and, and go along with the message of the site. So we've made some progress. At least we're not stuck with it always being black text on a white background. Now we can specify other attributes too. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to make the color of the font blue. All right. So notice I have a selector. I have the word background colon yellow, a semicolon. That's the first attribute. There's the name of the attribute, a colon, then the value of the attribute. What are we changing? We're changing the background. What are we changing it to? We're making it yellow. Second thing we're changing, the color, which represents the color of the font, the color of the text. What are we changing it to? We're changing that to blue. So now if we look at this, it looks like that. All right. Now, what do you suppose would happen if I did this? If I change that from body to 
header. What do you think is going to happen to my page? Yes, I've changed the selector to header. That means only the header gets this rule. So, previously the selector was body. That meant everything in the body gets this rule. Now I'm changing the selector to header. Now everything in the header is going to get that rule. What about the rest of the stuff on the page? What's it going to look like? It's going to look like as it did before we put any style in. It's going to be black text on a white background. Remember, and I've said this throughout uh, the, the previous couple of classes, all right, that the way the page looks is a combination of your style rules plus the browser default. So I specified a style rule for the header. So the header will get my style rule. What about the rest of the page? It gets the browser default. Except I am running Internet Explorer. And therefore there's a problem with that. And we'll, again, this is something we'll talk about next time. If I view it in Google Chrome, there we have it. That's our first example of what's called a browser incompatibility. The page worked fine up till this point. Because we weren't really taking advantage of HTML5 code. Now that we are, we're having a problem with Internet Explorer. Now we'll see a workaround for that later on. For now, I would just suggest viewing your pages in Google Chrome. All right. So we can have a bunch of style rules if we want. I could make a style rule for the nav that's just our, uh, the footer. That's just the opposite of this. Now the header looks like that. The footer looks like that. All right. Now, we're not going to do this just because we can. All right? We're going to learn to be able to change everything out the page that, about the page that you can imagine. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea to change everything about the page. You pick and choose the things that you want to change and set about the page in a way that emphasizes things, that makes them stand out. Now the user knows at a glance that this and that are different kinds of things on the page. They're not the same as the rest of the stuff. And they know that simply by virtue of the fact that they're different color. Things that mean the same should look the same. Things that are different should look different one way or another. All right. We will pick up on this next time. You're welcome to try this. On, I don't think it's a requirement for your second lab, but if you want to play around with it, I'm certainly not going to tell you that you can't work ahead and, and try to do this. So I'm going to upload this, and we'll see you then in lab.